All right, welcome, welcome. Today we're going to be going through the 2015 paper two, nice and easy. So question one, question one start by telling you that let P and Q be two propositions and it says state the inverse and the contrapositive of the statement P implies Q. All right, so you have the statement, they give you the conditional statement the conditional statement is given as P implies Q. P implies Q. That's the conditional. So write down the inverse. The inverse is just not P implies not Q. Not P implies not Q. That's the inverse. And then they also ask for the control positive. They ask for the control positive. And remember the control positive is logically equivalent to the conditional. So this is the control positive. The control positive is not Q implies not P. That is the control positive. Nice and easy, not Q implies, not P. All right, so now we gave them the conditional, we gave them the inverse, and we gave them the contrapositive. And we know that the conditional is logically equivalent to the contrapositive, and also the inverse is logically equivalent to the converse. All right, we know those things. Nice and easy. All right, let's look at the next part of the question. So this is part one, nice and easy. The next part says copy and complete the table below to show the truth value for P implies Q and not Q implies not P. So they're pretty much asking you to show that the conditional is logically equivalent to the contrapositive. Let's go ahead and do that. Show that the So first, let's complete the table. Let's put the table here. We have our two propositions, P and Q. Then we have not P in this column. Then we have not Q. Then we have P implies Q and we have not Q implies not P. So this takes care of all of them, all right? Excellent. So we have P, we have Q, we have not P, we have not Q. We have P implies Q, and we have not Q implies not P. The good thing is they already filled out the table for us with the truth values for P and Q, which makes it very easier. So you know you have true, true, and false, false. Then you have true, false, true, false. No, we want not P. What's gonna be not P? Not P is when you negate P right here, the negation of true, let's put it in Burgundy, the negation of true is false. The negation of true is false. The negation of false is true. The negation of false is true. For not Q now, the negation of true is false. The negation of false is true. The negation of true is false, and the negation of false is true. Good. Now for P implies Q. P implies Q is false only when P is true and Q is false. So if P is true and Q is false, then P implies Q did not take place. So this is the only time P implies Q is false. Everywhere else it is true. All right, 
And then not Q implies not B. Not Q implies not B is false whenever not Q is true, but not B is false. That's right here. And so this is the only time it is false. Everywhere else it is true. All right, so that's that. So what does this mean then? This means that as we can clearly see that the, from these two truth results, from the column of the truth results, we can see that P implies Q and not Q implies not P. Since they have the same truth values, then clearly we can say that they are logically equivalent. All right, so this is just a truth table for part two. Let's look at what part three asks. Part three is a hence state whether the compound statements are logically equivalent. Yes, they are logically equivalent. So let's state that here now. So part three. All right, let's fit part three up here. Hence, Hence, from the truth table results, we can see that P implies Q. P implies Q is logically equivalent. P implies Q is logically equivalent to not Q implies not P. Nice and easy, soft. From the truth table, we can clearly see this, all right? Clearly, from right here, they are the same, all right? So you can put it right here, the same. Nice. Now let's look at part B. Part B. All right, let's go to part B. Part B says that the polynomial f of x is equal to x cubed. f of x is equal to x cubed plus px squared minus x plus q. Let's write that down. f of x is x cubed plus px squared minus x plus q. This is f of x, all right? And it says, it has a factor of x minus five and a remainder of 24 when divided by x minus one. So what they're telling you is that f of five is equal to zero since x minus five is a factor. So if f of five is equal to zero, you can plug in five into the function to get five cube. So we work out what is five cube. I believe that's 125. So five cube, that's 125. Plus five square is 25. So we get 25p minus x is five right here. So we have minus five plus q, and this is equal to zero. You can just set up your equation from this now. So set up your equation. All right, so as you can see, it is 25p, 25p plus q, that is equal to 125 minus, minus five is 120. And when you bring it over to the other side, it's minus 120. All right, so we have one equation right here. Now let's go ahead and look at the second equation. The second equation that we're gonna generate, it says it has a remainder of 24 and divided by X minus one. So what they're telling you then is F of one is equal to 24, that's the remainder. So since f of one is equal to 24, 
we're good. All we need to do is substitute x as 1 into the equation, and we're going to get 1 plus 1 square is 1. So you get 1 plus p minus 1 plus q, and that's equal to 24. All right, this is equal to 24. But then you have to remember that 1 minus 1 cancel each other. And so this equation is just telling us that P plus Q is equal to 24. P plus Q is 24. You can go ahead and then just subtract these two equations that you've generated. And by subtracting these two equations, you're going to get 25P minus P is 24P. Subtracting them Q minus Q would have gone. Minus 120 minus 24 is minus 144. You can then divide through by 24. And so what do we get? Therefore, P is equal to minus 144 divided by 24. And so we get P equal negative six. So P is equal to negative six. Nice and easy. Now that we get P is negative six, we can go ahead and substitute back into any one of these equations to find what is Q. All right, so since P is negative six, I'm gonna plug it into this one. All right, P plus Q is 24. And so Q has to be 30, because 30 plus negative six is 24. So that implies that Q is equal to 30. All right, so we found the values of P and Q. Nice, so P is negative six and Q is 30. No issues, soft. And you can always check back your answer just by substituting P as negative six and Q as 30. Test to see if F of five is zero and F of one is 24, you can check it. Just, it's always good to just check your answer to make sure that you didn't make any mistake. All right, so we're fine. Now the next part says factorize f of x completely. To factorize f of x completely, all right, we're gonna write f of x is equal to, we can replace p now with the value that we know, so it's gonna be x cubed. Instead of plus p, x is minus six x squared, minus six x squared, minus x plus q, plus q, and q is, we said q was 30, so we have plus 30, all right? Now we need to factorize this expression. We already know that it's gonna be three linear factors, right? We know it's gonna be three linear factors, all right? Because it's a cubic expression. Now look how we're gonna find other linear factors. We don't want to be doing polynomial division all the time. That take up too much time sometimes. Utilize some other knowledge. So we know that x minus 5 is a factor. So we need the other two factors. So I'm going to put a here and b here. All right. And I'm going to put x minus a and x minus b for now. So we're going to find what is a and what is b. So you might say, sir, what are we doing? Ah. We're using up some other knowledge. We're using sums and products of roots. The sum of the three roots is six. And so we can write that the sum of six, six must be equal to five plus a plus b. Six must be equal to five plus a plus b. The sum of the three roots right here, which is six, must be equal to five plus a plus b. And so one is equal to a plus b. All right, the next thing is that, all right, next thing we know is that the product of the three roots is 30 minus D over A, so it's negative 30. So the product of the three roots is negative 30. So that means say five times A times B is negative 30. All right, so if five times A times B is negative 30. If I divide through by five, then negative six is equal to A times B. 
All right, so now I can just solve these equations simultaneously. All right, it's just easier than to do the polynomial division in my estimation. Or you can just look at it, which two number when you add them, you get one, when you times them, you get minus six. All right, you can just look at it and determine. In my estimation, we work it out. So minus six is equal to replace a or B by making one of these a subject, I see that A is one minus B. So this is one minus B times B, one minus B times B, one minus B times B is just, this is working out to be B minus B square, B minus B square, B minus B square, and this is minus six. And so all I have to do is bring it over now and I get B square minus B minus six. B square minus B minus six, that's equal to zero. Then I factorize it. Signs are different and the greater number is negative. All right. And so what I'm getting is B and B three, and two, signs are different. The greater number is negative. So I put a negative here and a plus here. And so B is minus two or B is minus two or B is three. All right. So if B is minus two, then I automatically get what is A. All right. If this is minus two, if you bring over minus two, you get A is three. All right. And if you put right here now, if B is three, then A is minus two. All right, nice and easy, nice and easy. All right, so now we can just replace it right here now. And so A is three, A is three, so it's X minus five times X minus three. And this B now is negative two, so it is X plus two, X plus two. All right, and we did it using sums and products of roots. All right, so make the examiner know that you know what you used to do it, to tell them, say, using sums and products of roots. Stop doing polynomial division all the time. It's so, it's so boring to always be doing polynomial division. So using sums and products of roots, we factorized it. All right, nice and easy, soft. Let's look at the next part of the question, part C. Part C now we're gonna be doing using mathematical induction. <coughs> so let's go. Part C says, given that Sn, given that Sn is equal to, they say Sn is equal to five, plus five square, plus five cube, plus we keep on adding all the way down to five to the N, this is SN, right? So in other words, I'm gonna rewrite SN. I am going to rewrite SN as the sum from R equal one to N of five to the R. That is Sn. In other words, Sn is the sum from R equal one to N of five to the R, all right? And they want us to show that. So they want us to prove, this is what they want us to prove. They want us to prove that four Sn, so they want us to prove that four times the sum from R equal one, four times the sum from R equal one to N of five, so the R is equal to five to the N, five to the N plus one minus five. This is what they want us to prove, that four times five to the R is equal to five to the N plus one minus five. So let's go ahead and prove this, all right? Again, to prove this, you start with your three cases. You start with N is equal to one. All right, when n is equal to one, the left-hand side, the left-hand side 
is going to be equal to the sum from r equal one to n, which is the sum from one to one, all right, of five to the r, which this is just five. So this is gonna be four times five. Another way to look at it is when n, r is equal to one, this is it, n is equal to one, it's just five, just the first term. Four times five, which is 20. That's the left-hand side, all right? Then the right-hand side is going to be the right hand side is going to be, all right, now we have this now, right hand side, put in one, it's gonna be five square, five square minus five, five square minus five is still 20. And so n equal one is true. So therefore, n equal one is true. n equal one is correct. So now we need to do is assume n equal k is true. That is step two. Assume n equal k is true. So let me split right here. We're gonna do part step three over there. So step two, assume n equal k is true, all right? So let n equal k, when n is equal to k, what we're getting is four times, four times the sum from r equal one, four times the sum from r equal one to k, because n is now k, of five to the r, and that is going to be equal to, that's going to be equal to five to the, K, n is k now, so it's five to the k plus one minus five, all right? And again, you assume that this is true. Assume it is true. Assume n equal k is true. Assume that is true, all right? Now let's go to step three. Step three now, we need to show that n equal k plus one is true if n equal k is true. For n equal k plus one, what we're gonna get is four times, we're supposed to get five to the k plus one plus one minus five. So pretty much you need to get five to the, five to the k plus two, all right? We need to get five to the k plus two. So now for n equal to k plus one, for n equal k plus one, we're gonna have that, we have four times the sum, four times the sum from r equal one to n of five to the r, n equal k plus one, sorry, why am I writing n? n is k plus one, so don't write the n, write k plus one. So it's four times the sum from this, so, so r equal one to k plus one of this, all right, that's going to be equal to the sum from one to k. Remember, it's equal to the sum from one to k. So it's gonna equal to the sum from r equal one to k of f of r of five to the r plus the k plus one term. The k plus one term is gonna be you putting k plus one over here. So the k plus one term is gonna be four times, four times, putting in k plus one here, it's five to the k plus one. That's the k plus one term, all right? And so what this is working out to be now is the sum from one to k of five r, we said that it's right here, it's five to the k plus one. So it is five to the k plus one, minus five plus four times five to the k plus one. All right, now look at this. You have five to the k plus one plus four times five to the k plus one. So that is just five. That's just five times five to the k plus one. 
All right, you have one donut and you have four donut. You add them and you get five donuts. So it's five times five to the K plus one. Minus five. Now, according to laws of indices, this five is really five to the first power. So it's really five to the first power being multiplied by five to the K plus one minus five. Now, whenever the bases are the same, we can add the powers. So whenever the bases are the same, we add the powers. So this becomes five to the K plus one, five to the K plus one plus one. It's five to the K plus one plus one. We add the powers minus five. And so therefore, N equal K plus one is true. So we can write our conclusion now. Therefore, N equal to K plus one is true if N equal K is true. Nice and easy, soft. So what do you finally conclude? Finally, you can conclude that hence, hence, by principles of mathematical induction, the statement, the statement above is true for all natural numbers. Nice and easy, soft. The statement above is true for all natural numbers. Nice and easy, soft. And that takes care of question number one. Too easy. Let's move on now to question two. Question two says, the relation F is such that it maps set A to set B and set G is being mapped from set B to set C. They are functions which are both one to one and unto. Show that G of F is one to one and unto. So there are two ways we can really do this proof. All right, so let's write down what they say. They tell us that the function F is such that it maps set A onto set B. All right. And the function G, the function A, the function A maps to set B and the function G is such that it maps set B onto set C. And so this is what we know. So what's going to happen? So G of F, so G of F, G of F, that function is gonna be such that it maps set A, where, where is G? G is this one. So G of F, putting F into G, okay. So G of F is gonna map from B to C first, all right? So let me start it with this proof then, the function G of F, all right? So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna do it by example, right? You can, you can do it by example, let, let give F some values then, give F some values. So you can give F the set, maybe you can make F be, let's make it easy and write P, Q, R, this is in the set A, and in the set B, we have maybe one, two, three, all right? Let this be the function f, all right? Doing it with the example. And they said that f is one to one and unto. All right, so let's make p map to one, q map to two, r map to three. All right, this is f. Let this be f, all right? And then g now, we can make g be something like, well, b is gonna be one, two, three, all right? One, two, three, and it's mapped to some new set, set C. We can let set C be maybe A, B, C. All right, let's set C be A, B, C. So one will map to A, two will map to B, and three will map to C. All right, 
So G is also one to one and on to remember they said that. So this is the function G, all right? So now they want G, what did they want? I think they want G of F. They want G of F. So they want us to put F into G. So G of F. So they want G of F, all right? So G of F is what they want, which they want us to put F into G. So we're on the domain of F. So G of F is pretty much this. G of F is gonna be putting in F into G. So this is what you're having. You're applying F first and then you're gonna apply G. All right, you're applying F first and then you're gonna apply G. So you have, this is A, this is set B, and this is set C, all right? And so applying that, you're gonna have P, Q, R, set B, which is redefined as one, two, three, and set C, which is A, B, C, all right? So P maps to one, Q maps to two, R maps to three, one gonna map to A, and two gonna map to B, and three gonna map to C. And so in reality, G of F, G of F is such that it's just mapping set A to set C. That's what G of F is doing. It's just mapping set A to set C. So finally gonna write it down here that this is G of A, G of F, G of F, is this. So G of F is P, Q, R, and it's being mapped to A, B, C, all right? This is using examples. And so hence, hence as we can see, so we can make our conclusion now. Let's write the conclusion over here. Conclusion. So hence, G of F, G of F is one to one and unto on the domain of F. It's always on the domain of F, all right? As we can see, as we can see, it is one to one, and it is onto, but it's on the domain of F, all right? It's on the domain of F, and you can even add a little further note, you can say as, as G of F will map set A onto set C, all right? All right, that's what G of F do. That's one way of doing it. Now let's look at the alternate method right here, or, right? Let's look at alternate method, or. That's one way to do that question. The alternate method is you're gonna do a lot of discussion. We're gonna show them that we have our knowledge about functions, right? So using your knowledge, since you know that you have your knowledge of function, it told us that F is one to one and G is one to one, comma. So G, so the composite function, so the composite function G of F will be on the domain of the inner function will be on the domain of the inner function F, put in bracket, that is set A. And since both F and G are one to one, then G of F will 
also be one to one, but on the domain of the inner function f. Hence, g of f is one to one. This is if you wanted to show them that you have your functions knowledge, you know what you're talking about. It's always on the domain of the inner function. So you can tell them that. All right, nice and easy. All right, soft. You can go ahead pretty much and tell them the same for unto. You can tell them that f is unto. You can tell them that f is surjective. F is surjective and G is surjective. Right, and so the composite function G F will be on the domain of the inner function F that is set A. And since both F and G are surjective, because remember that's what Anto means, surjective, then G of F will also be surjective. but on the domain of the inner function. Hence, g of f, hence g of f is on two, all right? Nice and easy, soft. All right, that takes care of the first part of this question. All right, this functions question, nice and easy, soft. All right, let's look now at what's happening with the next part of the question. Part two. Part two says solve the following equation. So we have some equations to go ahead and solve. So we're going to solve three minus four. So part A, we're solving three minus four over nine to the x, three minus four over nine to the x, minus four over 81 to the x. And we're solving this equal to zero. Now the first thing I want to do is, I want to rewrite this equation as, rewriting it as three minus four over nine to the x minus four over, instead of saying 81, I'm gonna rewrite this as nine square and nine square to the x is just nine to the two x. Uh -huh. And that's equal to zero. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to multiply this equation by nine to the two x. So I'm gonna multiply through this equation by nine to the two x. By multiplying this equation through by nine to the two x, what I'm getting is this becomes three times nine to the two x. And remember nine to the two x can be written as nine to the x all square by laws of indices minus, this is gonna become four times nine to the x. And then this is just gonna become minus four is equal to zero, all right? Nice. All right, now what you can do is you can call that y, all right? You don't have to call it y, you can just factorize it, but let's say you prefer to call it, let y be equal to nine to the x. You can do that, let y equal to nine to the x. And so you're getting three y squared minus four y minus four is equal to zero. Now you can go ahead and factorize it. So you can factorize it now. And what you're getting is, if it is three y squared minus four y minus four equal to zero, signs are different, the greater number is negative. So we have three y and y, the bigger one is negative. So this two is minus, 
this is plus. This has to be two as well. Let's check it out. This times this is three y squared. This times this is minus six y. This times this is plus two y, which give us back minus four y. So we're good. So in this case, we're getting that y is equal to, from right here, y is minus two over three. And if y is minus two over three here, and here we're getting y is two. But let's just bear in mind that we know that y is nine to the x, All right? We know that y is nine to the x. So really and truly what we're solving is nine to the x. Let me make some space here. So really and truly what we're solving is nine to the x is equal to negative two over three. Now you cannot have a you cannot have a number and raise it to a power and get minus two over three. So you can tell them that this is crazy. You can tell them that this is crazy. This is crazy. That's crazy, All right? This is crazy. You can't raise a number to a power and get a negative answer. So you can throw that away. So the only part we'll focus on is the nine to the X being equal to two. If nine to the X is equal to two, well, we can take logs of both sides by taking the log of both sides, we can get that um, x log nine, right? Using laws of logarithm, x log nine is equal to the log of two. And so we divide both sides by log nine to write that x is equal to log two over log nine. And so we find x, x is log two over log nine. And then you put that in your calculator, log two, divide by the log of nine. And so you get 0 0.1, 0 0.315. So that is X, X is 0 0.315, 0 0.315, that is X, All right? Nice and easy, soft. Log two over log nine, which is 0 0.315. Okay, now let's look at the second part of the question. The second part of the question, it says that we are supposed to solve the modulus of five X minus six, and we're supposed to solve that equal to X plus five. So let's go ahead and do that. We're solving the modulus, we're solving the modulus of 5x minus 6, we're solving that, and that is equal to x plus 5. There are two ways you can do this question. If mod a is equal to b, then we know that 5x minus 6 is equal to x plus 5, or we know that 5x minus 6, we know that that is going to be equal to minus of x plus 5. It's one of the two. And so it works out that to be if we subtract x over here, subtract x, we get 4x. And then we add 6 to both sides, we get 4x equal 11. Divide through by 4, we get x is 11 over 4. That's one answer. Over here, now we have or. If we, this becomes minus x. So bring it over here, it becomes 6x is equal to, we have minus six here. So we bring over the minus six. If we bring over the minus six, we're gonna get adding six to over here, six minus five, six minus five is one. So you have six X is equal to one. And so what you're getting then is X is equal to one over six, all right? So that's what you get right there. All right, nice and easy. So those are the possible solution. X is equal to 11 over four, or X is equal to one over six. When you finish, you just want to test your answer. Always test it, always test it. So this is how you test it, test. You need to check, let's start with when X is 11 over four. When X is 11 over four, you need to plug it in here to see if the mod of five times 11 over four minus six, that will work out to be, oh, testing that, it works out to be five times 11 over four 
minus six, that's seven and three quarter, that's 7.75. Let's test if we get the same over here. Yes, we're gonna get the same over here. 11 over four plus five, that is indeed equal to 7.75. And so 11 over four is good. Let's check when X is one over six. When X is one over six, what you do now is when X is one over six, you put it in here and you have the modulus of five times one over six minus six. The modulus of that is equal to, you put it in here, put it in a calculator, five times one over six minus six. The modulus of that is five and one over six. So that's five and one over six, which is 5.167, all right? And on the right-hand side, it's gonna be one over six plus five, which is the same as 5.167. And so both answers are correct. So both answers are correct. That is x is equal to 11 over four or x is equal to one over six. Now there's always an alternate method to doing these questions. You didn't have to go by this direct method, all right? What you could have done is square both sides, which is a popular choice. The popular choice is to square both sides where what some persons would do is square both sides to get 5x minus six, all square, 5x minus six all square is equal to x plus five all square. All right, this is just the alternate method, which I wouldn't recommend, right? This is just wasting time. I recommend the first method. Then you know you expand the square, first term square, which is 25x squared, minus twice the product of the two, six times five is 30, so that's minus 60x, plus second term square, second term square is plus 36. And then you expand the square over here, it is first term square, which is x squared, twice the product of the two, which is 10x, the second term square, which is five square, which is 25. Nice and easy. After you do that, now you know you bring over your x square over here, so you get 24x square. 24x square. Bring over the 10x over here to get minus 70x. Then you bring over the 25 over here to get plus 11. That's equal to zero. I expand this right. 25x squared minus 60x plus 36. Yes, this is expanded correctly. So now it's to just go ahead and uh, factorize this, or you could just use quadratic formula from here. Go ahead and use quadratic formula. All right, you could just use quadratic formula from here and you could get that X is going to be equal to 70 plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC. When I work that out, that will be 70 plus or minus 62 over 2A, two times 24 is 48. As you can see, the two answers you're getting are 70 plus 62 divided by 48, you're getting the 11 over four. So in this case, you're getting X is 11 over four, or you're getting X is one over six. All right, nice and easy. So anyway, you take it, you get in the two answer them 11 over four or one over six. So you can either use it by, you know, squaring both sides, or you can remember this rule. This is the rule that you need to remember. If the modulus of A is equal to B, then 
a is equal to minus b or a is equal to b. So that's the rule that you need to remember, right? That's the modulus rule. Very easy to remember, soft. All right, let's continue now. Go ahead and look at the next part of the question. The next part of the question says, the growth of the population or the growth of bacteria in a river after time t is given by n is equal to 300 plus five to the t. All right, so let's write that down. The number of bacteria in a river is given by n is equal to 300 plus five to the t. n is equal to 300 plus five to the t. All right, that is n. So now the question that they're asking is, find the number of bacteria present when t is equal to zero. All right, so when t equals zero, we're gonna substitute in t into this equation. When t is zero, we we'll plug in t is zero, and so we get n is equal to 300 plus five to the zero, and anything to the zero power is one, and so n is equal to 301. That's the first part, nice and easy. Soft, n is 301. Now let's go to the second part of this question. The second part in this question now, it says that find the time required to triple the number of bacteria. So initially, there is 301 bacteria, and you need to find the time that the bacteria will be tripled. So in part two, a tripling of the bacteria, if you triple 301, so it's three times 301, that's when the bacteria is tripled, three times 301, not 300, three times 301, and we're gonna set that equal to 300, plus five to the T. And we're gonna find out in how many, T is in hours, we're gonna find out in how many hours it takes the bacteria to triple, all right? So we expand this, and so we're getting 903 is equal to 300 plus five to the T. And so all you have to do now is subtract 300 from both sides. Subtracting 300 from both sides, we get 603 is equal to five to the T. So to solve for T now, all you need to do is take log of both sides. So we're gonna take the log of both sides and so the log of 603 is gonna be equal to the log of five to the T log of five to the t, but by laws of logarithm, we can bring down the t. So let's write it as t log five, write it as t log five. And so t is gonna be equal to log of 603 divided by the log of five. That's how we find t, the log of 603 divided by the log of five. So you put this in a calculator to work out what is the log of 603. Log of 603 divided by the log of five, and I'm getting 3.977. Always round off the three significant figures, so that's 3.98 hours. So it's taking roughly, so you can give them a statement. It is taking Roughly, it is taking roughly four hours. It is taking roughly 3.98 hours. And if you want to convert it to minutes, 0 0.98 times 60. So in reality, it is taking roughly 3.98 hours. That is, that is, it is taking three hours and 58, 58, it's taking three hours, 58 minutes and, 
and 48 seconds, it's taking roughly three hours, 58 minutes and 48 seconds for the number of bacteria to be tripled. That's what is happening. So in conclusion, so I would say in my estimation, the river is very polluted, is very polluted, all right? This is a very polluted Caribbean river, very polluted, very, very polluted, a little too polluted, all right? All right, Eric, let's go. So that takes care of module one. All right, now we get to go on to module two.